It's a story over 2,000 years old about the birth of China's first imperial dynasty. It was a time of conflict, a time of betrayal, and the lust for power. It has all the makings of a great novel, really. It's got intrigue, it's got violence, sex, mystery. At its center is Qin Shi Huang, the emperor who created a superpower out of warring factions, a controversial figure historians viewed with scorn. They portray him as irrational, deeply superstitious, incompetent, a tyrant. But is this depiction of Qin Shi Huang fact or fiction? What we know comes from the account by Sima Qian, who was actually writing during the historical period following the Qin Dynasty. His achievements outweigh any of his failures. Was he an incompetent ruler, a brutal tyrant, or a great leader? Now it's time to take another look at China's first emperor. Two forty six BC. In Far East Asia, war had been raging for nearly two centuries. The collapse of a five hundred year old dynasty had unleashed a ruthless power struggle between seven rival states, each one vying for dominance, each bent on conquest. What once was the Zhou Empire had fractured into pieces. The battlefield was where disputes were resolved. <laughs> Playing out the ambitions of their leaders, thousands of warriors engaged in a ritual of combat, wielding swords and facing their destiny. It remained to be seen which of the warring states would emerge victorious and become the new power in the region. During the chaos in Xianyang, the capital of Qin State, on the western border of the crumbling dynasty, a new king was crowned. His ascension to the throne was unexpected, and to some within the kingdom represented an opportunity. This new king was 13 years old, ill-equipped for the responsibilities of being a monarch. He inherited a palace rife with intrigue, deception, and duplicity. Few believed he could guarantee his own safety, let alone control the fate of his kingdom. But this seemingly unremarkable heir would do what no ruler had done before make one nation from the remnants of a broken empire. His name was Ying Zheng, later to be called Qin Shi Huang. But there's little we know of him. The primary source for Qin Shi Huang's life is this Han Dynasty text called Records of the Grand Historian, written by Sima Qian. Written, as it turns out, more than a century after Qin Shi Huang died, and it really is a magnificent text. It's, it's very compelling, it's full of detail, and dialogue, and it has all the makings of, uh, of a great novel, really. But is that text accurate? According to Sima Qian, living with the young ruler was Zhang's widowed mother, Queen Dowager Zhao. She was the only person the young boy king could trust. Or so it seemed. What he didn't know was beneath his mother's serene gaze, there lurked a dark motive. She installed a palace minister to act as his advisor, an influential ally who would allow the queen access to her son's royal power. His name was Lu Bu 
the man who had introduced the queen when she was a lowly concubine to the previous king. So when the young king first ascended the throne, he was just a teenager. And it would have been common practice at that time to have appointed a regent uh, for rulers who had not yet come of age. As regent and advisor to Ying Zhang, Liu Bowei was the most influential man in the palace, the power behind the throne, who would rule the kingdom from the shadows. But he had a secret of his own to hide. He was Queen Zhao's lover and the likely father of the young king. Liu Buwei was concerned the young king would find out about his affair with the queen, which he feared would cost him his position in the court. To conceal his relationship with the queen, Liu Buwei looked for a man who could replace him in the queen's bedroom, a man he could trust and his queen would accept. Liu Buwei found a well-endowed man and uh, paraded him about so that uh, Ying Zheng's mother's uh, lasciviousness would be aroused. Liu Bui's scheme worked at first. Lao Ai disguised himself as a eunuch so he could enter the queen's chamber without suspicion and ultimately capture her heart. The queen was a willing accomplice in Liu Bui's plan. Away from prying eyes, she and Lao Ai began a torrid affair that fueled a plot to overthrow her son, the king. The trails coming from within the palace were perils young Zhang had to anticipate. He may have possessed a king's power, but being a teenager, he was too inexperienced to use it effectively. As a result, he had to rely on Liu Bui's advice, which may not have always been in his best interests. Despite the constant state of war in the region, Ying Zhang had inherited a kingdom that was steadily growing. There were talented generals, there were wise ministers already in place, and Lu Buwei was among them. So while Ying Zheng was a teenager, the Qin state continued to grow and consolidate land and uh, become more and more powerful. But the end to centuries of war was still off in the future. Rival states were consumed in battling each other for survival and for supremacy. It would take a bold leader with fearless vision to rise above the fray and seize victory from his enemies. Eight years later, 238 BC. The affair between the queen and her lover had flourished. Lao Ai no longer pretended to be a servile eunuch. With the queen's support, he was now a powerful man, and the pair secretly had two sons together. But Lao Ai wanted more than lavish palace comforts. He had his sights set on a bigger prize. Lao Ai had 3,000 men under him and was recruiting more all the time. He wanted to seize Ying Zhong's throne for himself. But Lao Ai underestimated the now 22-year-old king. Ying Zhang got word of the planned coup. Liu Bui's matchmaking was about to backfire, leaving him exposed to the wrath of an outraged king. When his plot to overthrow King Ying Zhang was discovered, Lao Ai decided to make his move. 
without the element of surprise, he and his followers rode toward the palace, intent on making a preemptive strike. But the king was no longer a naive teenager. He had learned from his palace ministers and military advisors and had carefully planned a response. The king saw his chance to eliminate both Lao Ai, who was after his throne, and Lu Bue, his scheming, too powerful regent. Ying Zhang anticipated that Lao Ai would try to storm the palace by entering the front gate. He set a trap, and Lao Ai and the rebels fell into it. Lao Ai could only wonder who had orchestrated the attack. Then he spotted Lu Bue, the man responsible for his rise in the palace. The co-conspirators were now mortal enemies. Lu Bue never thought that Lao Ai would pose a threat to his power in the court. But now, he saw that if he didn't help stop Lao Ai's plan to overthrow Ying Zhong, he could lose everything. So that's why Lu Wei sided with the king against Lao Ai. It was all about preserving his position in the kingdom. To fail in a palace coup is to invite the most severe punishment. Lao Ai, the queen's lover, paid a terrible price for daring to plot against the king. <laughs> Lao Ai and 3,000 of his men were executed or exiled by Ying Zhang. But Ying Zhang didn't stop there. He had the sons of Lao Ai and his mother killed to keep them from one day seeking revenge against him. In a gesture of mercy, Ying Zhang spared his mother, but placed her under house arrest. Now he had one last conspirator to deal with. Lu Bue, his advisor and the mastermind of the match between Lao Ai and the queen, would have to pay for his betrayal. Ying Zhong dealt with Lu Bu Wei at once. He sentenced him to exile in Sichuan province, where Lu Bu Wei later committed suicide by drinking a cup of poisoned wine. So here, for the first time since taking the throne, Ying Zhong showed his willingness to act for himself. It was a turning point in the growth of the young ruler, the moment when Ying Zheng becomes uh, the king of Qin and this powerful man uh, is the moment at which Lu Bu Wei uh, decides to drink poison and, and kill himself, uh, realizing that he had angered what had now become the world's most powerful man. Ying Zheng went on to unveil an ambitious plan to unify the seven warring states into one. He began to appoint men of ability, guest officers, regardless of their background and origin. One of the first was Li Su. Originally from the Chu state, Li Su had a superb legal mind and would later draw up the ruling ideology of the Qin Empire. Here we have an example of the first emperor allowing someone who came from an enemy state to serve him in a close position because he recognized that Li Su was someone who could be of use. Ying Zhang promoted another talented foreigner, Zhang Guo, a hydraulic engineer from the nearby Han state. In this case, what the first emperor wished to have Zhang Guo 
build for him was a canal that could be used to transform the area, the plain around the capital of Qin into uh, a fertile area. However, the canal project hit a snag from the very start. Ying Zhang learned that Zheng Guo, whom he trusted, was actually a spy from the Han state, sent to divert Qin's resources to wasteful projects. The king's most powerful advisors urged him to expel all foreign officers from the state. But then Li Se from the Chu state weighed in. He risked expulsion by writing a petition, arguing that foreigners like himself were needed if Ying Zhang was to achieve his dream of unifying the states. Lisa's petition was persuasive. Instead of expelling Zhang Guo, the king ordered him to continue building the canal. Many of the king's advisors urged him to expel all foreigners. But Ying Zhong rejected the idea. He was convinced that accepting them in his kingdom and using their talents was of greater benefit. Ying Zhang's decision to welcome foreigners would alter the course of Chinese history. The canal that Zhang Gua completed made the Guanzhong Plain into fertile land. And as agricultural production increased, the Qin Kingdom grew richer than other states. With his treasury overflowing, Ying Zhang was determined to make his dream of uniting the warring states a reality. He reportedly recruited a million men to become soldiers, supplying them with the latest weapons and training them in the art of war. The result was a formidable fighting machine. It would take time, but Ying Zhang's warriors were ready to mobilize. A million men stood poised to sacrifice their lives to fight their enemies on the battlefield and build Ying Zhang's mighty empire. In 230 BC, the 29-year-old King of Qin embarked on an epic campaign of conquest. He wanted to create an empire out of the pieces of the crumbling Zhou dynasty. And now he had the army to do it. The King's forces numbered over a million men had a vast arsenal of weapons and knew only one battle strategy, to attack. The first target in Ying Zhang's plan was the neighboring state of Han to the east. In the past, the states of the Zhou dynasty created a series of alliances and coalitions to protect themselves against the threat of a powerful enemy. It worked for a while, but things were different this time. Diplomacy proved useless against the Qin war machine. In little time, the Han state fell. Then, Ying Zhang set his sights on another neighbor, Zhao State. Blood flowed freely on the battlefield. The Qing military was such a powerful fighting force that the other kingdoms grew desperate to come up with strategies to counteract them. One of them was the kingdom of Yan. Two years into the war, diplomats from Yan arrived in Qin. Their declared purpose was to make amends with the Qin state 
and negotiate a peace. As proof, the Yan envoys came bearing gifts for Ying Zhang. The envoy, Jing Ke, brought a box containing the severed head of a Qin general, who years earlier had fled to Yan after betraying the Qin state. Jing Ke also brought a map of the Yan lands to be presented to the ruler as a gesture signifying the peaceful surrender of the state. But hidden within the map was a surprise. While Ying Zhang avoided the poison dagger, he was on his own against the assassin. The king's ministers are not able to come to his aid because uh, there's a law that says they must ask permission to move about the throne room, and they're not allowed to carry weapons either. Ying Zhang eluded Jing Ke. Then, sword in hand, he killed him. Despite escaping unharmed, the assassination attempt infuriated the king. Enraged, he ordered his army to retaliate by speeding up the war against his adversaries. The slaughter began. The neighboring states were no match for Qin's massive army of skillfully trained soldiers. Ten years passed. One by one, the Qin armies conquered the six neighboring states that battled for the past 200 years. Ying Zhang's dream of creating an empire became a reality. People had thought about an empire that occupied, in effect, the whole world. But it was Ying Zheng who actually created it. And by doing so, he created an ideal that would remain important for the remainder of Chinese history up until the present day. 221 BC. A massive crowd gathered for a coronation ceremony in the capital of Qin where at 38 years old, Ying Zhang named himself Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of a vast new territory, a territory we now know as China. The title of emperor meant that there was now one and only one sovereign, a declaration that the entire country was under his rule. This was the birth of China, a land of warring states that was now one nation. It was the dawn of a new era. Ying Shen's assumption of the title, the August First Emperor of Qin, or Qin Shi Huang, is crucial because it suggests to us that he no longer saw himself merely as a terrestrial king, but rather he saw his role as being elevated to that of the ruler of an empire um, and a role that could be viewed perhaps on cosmic proportions. But as emperor, Qin Shi Huang still faced many challenges. Among them was the need to bring together people from different states and cultures under a single system to consolidate his realm. It's pretty clear that he recognized that what he was doing had never been done before. It was important to him that people not think of themselves as loyal to former kingdoms, but rather loyal to the Qin Empire. Unification began with a change in the system of government. Qin Shi Huang abolished feudalism, dividing the empire into 36 prefectures, or provinces, which were placed under his direct control. This centralization of power was unprecedented. Officials were appointed to positions on the basis of merit and ability, 
rather than on hereditary rights or family ties. This system, known as legalism, represented a break from previous traditions. The early legalists viewed humans as essentially selfish, but not necessarily in a bad way. Uh, they thought the state could harness this selfishness and allow their subjects to pursue their desires and passions in the service of the state. Qin Shi Huang had to overcome fierce opposition from powerful ministers for his reformations to succeed. To do so, he relied on Li Se, who served as his prime minister and wrote many of Qin's new laws. Qin didn't emphasize ritual and tradition, but instead they emphasized law and the importance of law codes, of something that didn't vary or change according to family or according to local place. This is something introduced by the Qin. In 1975, archaeologists got a first-hand look at Qin's legal system when over a thousand bamboo slips were found in a small village in Hunan province. Analysis revealed that the laws were written during Qin Shi Huang's reign. The bamboo slips demonstrate how extensive and strict the laws were at the time. They regulated people's lives closely and harsh punishments were meted out to violators. There were also other changes in store for the empire. Li Se standardized weights and measurements. Units of volume, length, and weight were made uniform to simplify trade and tax collection. Qin Shi Huang continued his standardization policy throughout the empire. This is the Ban Liang coin of the Qin. At the time, different regions of the country used different types of currency. Qin Shi Huang unified the currency with Ban Liang coins, making buying and selling easier throughout China. But that wasn't the last of the emperor's changes. Among the reforms that Qin Shi Huang introduced to unify China, one stood as the most challenging. Each state in the newly created empire had its own form of writing, which made communication between them difficult. This was the biggest stumbling block to enforcing Qin's new laws and policies. It was important to unify the writing system as quickly as possible. The emperor sent scholars to each province to teach the Qin script. Since writing systems express thought and culture, Qin Shi Huang knew that without a unified script, his empire could dissolve into chaos. Posing a universal written language made for better communication and acceptance of policies. These characters mean horse in the varying scripts of each state. Qin Shi Huang unified them with the Qin script. The significance of introducing a standardized system of writing cannot be overstated because it facilitated greatly the new system bureaucracy that was introduced under Qin Shi Huang. Many of the standardized Chinese characters established during the Qin dynasty have survived to the present day. Qin Shi Huang had achieved what many had dreamed, but no one had done before, uniting the warring states into a single nation. He created a new society based not on custom and tradition, but on a powerful central government and the rule of law. Yet despite this achievement, Qin Shi Huang has been portrayed throughout 2,000 years of history 
as a cruel and brutal tyrant. Some ancient records claim the emperor ordered the burning of books that he believed criticized his rule or undermined his power. He was also said to have decreed that dissident scholars be buried alive. The reasons for book burning, essentially suppressing freedom of thought and speech, were political. The emperor was concerned about the spread of ideas opposing his reformation policies and challenging the legitimacy of his rule. Yet historians today question whether wholesale book burnings actually occurred. We doubt very much that if the burning of the books ever happened, that it really represented a burning of all of literature. I think we should, if it happened, we should take it as an example of a government wanting to control information, wanting to define what is right and what is wrong, to create a kind of orthodoxy. And I think there's nothing especially unique in that. Every country, every civilization wants to be able to tell its story the way they want to tell it. According to the historical accounts, the Qin Dynasty did not destroy all books. Some copies of forbidden texts were preserved in the emperor's imperial archives. Writings on medicine, farming, technology, and astronomy were known to be kept in the palace. It's evidence that Qin Shi Huang did value practical knowledge. But more disturbing than book burnings are accounts of the emperor's brutality, designed to enforce obedience through intimidation. According to the records of historians writing after the fall of the Qin Dynasty, Qin Shi Huang ordered that 460 Confucian scholars who owned copies of forbidden books were to be buried alive. But these accounts were written over a century after the burials were to have occurred, which leads historians to doubt their validity. And since in Chinese history, there was a long-standing practice of dynastic histories being written by um, the successor dynasties, the view that is presented of Qin Shi Huang by Sima Qian, who was actually writing during the historical period following the Qin Dynasty, uh, presents a ruler um, who was a tyrant. Whenever people talked about bad rulers, bad kings in the past, one of the things they would say about a bad ruler or a bad king was that this was a person who had no respect for scholars and buried them or, or burned documents. And so, in effect, what, what we're told about the first emperor is just part of a tradition of criticizing rulers that you don't like. And so, in my view, I don't think we can give very much historical weight to those claims made against the first emperor. Rather than being a cruel tyrant, it's likely that Qin Shi Huang was a target of political propaganda created by the Han Dynasty that succeeded his. Its purpose was to discredit the Qin Dynasty and by doing so, justify and elevate its own existence. All of our sources for Qing Dynasty history come from the subsequent dynasty, the Han Dynasty. And so we always have to sort of take them with a grain of salt, considering that they consistently portray Qin Dynasty ministers and Qin Shi Huang himself as somewhat tyrannical, somewhat opportunistic, and ultimately a failure. Many of today's scholars see Qin Shi Huang in a different light. Qin Shi Huang is often portrayed as an evil tyrant. But actually, 
He was a king who was more fair-minded than he's given credit for. He didn't tolerate corruption from bureaucrats, especially when it came at the expense of the people. I think we should reevaluate how we view Qing Shi Huang. By virtue of his military and political prowess, Qin Shi Huang ended centuries of conflict and brought peace to the constantly warring states. During his 12-year reign, he journeyed throughout his realm in the company of his army to inspect the nation he had built. But he also had a personal reason for undertaking these tours. He wanted to live as long as possible. He wanted to prolong his lifetime. And so one of the reasons for making these uh, uh, expeditions around his empire was to look for the secrets of immortality that would enable the first emperor to extend his lifetime and extend his reign so that he could continue uh, to rule over his empire. As he traveled through his empire, Qin Shi Huang had stone monuments called stele erected to commemorate his tours. Engraved on them are his decrees, achievements, and exploits, the only written records from the time. But even after forming a mighty superpower, Qin Shi Huang's realm was not free from outside threats. and it led him to undertake one of the ancient world's most extensive construction projects to defend his nation. The Great Wall of China, erected as a defensive perimeter against enemies attacking from the north, has become Qin Shi Huang's most visible legacy. Today, it draws some 10 million visitors a year. Portions of the wall had already existed, built by rulers of the states Qin Shi Huang had conquered. The emperor's plan was to connect those walls with newly built barricades, a project involving as many as a million of his subjects working over many years. And so he set about consolidating these pre-existing walls of other kingdoms. They weren't the brick and stone wall we know now, that was primarily a project of the Ming Dynasty. The Qin Dynasty wall was tamped earth, uh, essentially setting up uh, wooden frameworks and tamping earth between them uh, and then raising the frame to the desired height. Once completed, the Great Wall formed a vast structure running over 5,000 miles a monument to Qin Shi Huang's vision of a great Chinese empire. His final great construction project was creating a national network of roads. 2,000 years later, these magnificent roads testify to the splendor of the Qin dynasty. The emperor probably traveled along this roadway on his inspection tours. The empire that Qin Shi Huang created was centered around the Yellow River and stretched from the Great Wall in the north to the borders of Vietnam in the south. His accomplishments are staggering. In just over two decades of rule, Qin Shi Huang laid the foundation of China that would last for the next 2,000 years. Once a vulnerable 13-year-old king controlled by others, Ying Zhang survived treachery in the palace, outwitted his enemies, and became a powerful leader. After a decade-long war, he unified China and built an empire. Despite a reputation that portrayed him as a tyrant, Qin Shi Huang has emerged as a ruler who transformed the world he was born into. His achievements outweigh any of his failures. 
Some say that he was too harsh and that his massive building projects may have sped up the fall of the Qing Empire. Others are even more dismissive, saying he burned books and killed scholars. But if we look at his entire reign, we can see that he devoted his life to the development of China as a nation. In my view, he certainly wasn't the tyrant the historical records claimed that he was. 210 BC, 12 years after China was unified. Qin Shi Huang was on another quest, this time for immortality. Now 50 years old, the emperor was exhausted from overwork and weakened from ingesting mercury pills, which he believed would make him immortal. On a hot summer day, during a tour of eastern China, the emperor died. Not in his royal palace, but in his carriage. The exact cause of death was never revealed, though it's thought mercury poisoning likely played a part in his demise. The emperor's body was returned to the Qin capital and then laid to rest in his mausoleum under the man-made mountain in nearby Xianyang. The funeral procession entered a tomb that was the stuff of wonder. A lavish, divinely inspired replica of his empire awaited him underground, a world he believed he would rule in the afterlife for eternity. Records from historian Sima Qian claim that it took 700,000 workers 38 years to build the mausoleum. Joining him in the afterlife were many priceless treasures, including rare birds and animals, as well as his childless wives, all sealed with Qin Shi Huang in his burial chamber. A ruler who dreamed of immortality, he also had an army of terracotta warriors buried nearby to protect him in the afterlife and enhance his legacy. Qin Shi Huang has had a great influence over the last 2,000 years of China's history. Many of the systems and policies that he originated during his reign are still in place today. He is the one figure who cannot be left out of any record of Chinese history. Just four years after Qin Shi Huang died, the dynasty he established collapsed. But the nation he created lived on and still exists today. China is a country of 1.4 billion people, comprising 55 different ethnic groups who speak 120 different languages. Home to this rich diversity, for the past 2,000 years, it's remained one nation. We should keep in mind that the boundaries of empire uh, that Ying Zheng created are more or less the boundaries of modern-day China. China now enjoys the greatest economic prosperity in its history. Scholars tell us the essential principles and beliefs of Qin Shi Huang are still woven into the fabric of the nation. I think it's safe to say that perhaps the most important legacy of Qin Shi Huang is the idea of empire itself. Over 2,000 years ago, the 13-year-old ruler of a kingdom in Far East Asia ordered the building of his mausoleum. The boy would go on to conquer and unify the seven warring states of a crumbling dynasty, making it one nation for the first time. He would later be known as Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of Qin, and would leave behind an enduring legacy that has shaped the China we know today. But the location and magnificence of his final resting place was lost for centuries. He was laying some of the most intricate preparations to go on living after that. Then, in 1974, workers in northwest China found fragments of a clay figure and unearthed 
one of the greatest archaeological discoveries in history. Nothing like that had been discovered before that time. This was completely unprecedented. Archaeologists would excavate thousands of terracotta soldiers, horses, and chariots. How were these life-size figures made? Why were they equipped with real weapons? And what other secrets are there buried deep beneath the colossal man-made mountain honoring China's first emperor? During the summer of 1974, near the central Chinese city of Xianyang, came news of a spectacular archaeological find. Buried some 15 feet below ground, not one, but hundreds of life-sized figures made of clay. An army of soldiers that would become known as the Terracotta Warriors. Archaeologist Yuan Zhang Yi was one of the excavators working at the site. When the terracotta soldiers were discovered, people in China and around the world were amazed. Teams of archaeologists descended upon the site, combing through dirt and clay, trying to solve a mystery over 2,000 years old. It was a puzzle because no one had any idea what the statues were. Some people thought they were statues of gods. A few old women went inside the site and burned incense and worshipped them. Other people said they were false gods and that they should be destroyed. No one knew who created the figures, nor did they know when or why. Hundreds of objects were dug up during the excavation, but archaeologists' questions remained unanswered. Then they uncovered a vital clue to solving the mystery. A number of relics they could pin down to a specific time period. They were bronze weapons called a dagger axe. It consists of a long wooden shaft with a blade attached to the tip and was used to thrust at and stab the enemy. Researchers found on the blades of the weapons a statement written in a Chinese script from the 3rd century BC. In the pit of the terracotta soldiers, some weapons were excavated. And on those weapons were inscriptions of the ministers of the time, including Lu Buwei who served under Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of the Qing dynasty. This confirmed that the tomb nearby was Qin Shi Huang's. It was impossible to think otherwise. But only after more excavation did archaeologists learn the extent of the discovery. They attributed the vast tableau to the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, the ruler who created the nation out of a group of warring provinces. The figures, dubbed the Terracotta Warriors, looked vividly lifelike, as if blood flowed through their veins. Standing in battle-ready formation, this army was unveiled for the first time in over 2,000 years. The Terracotta Army captured the public's imagination and fueled intense curiosity about that ancient era. Visitors wanted to know more about the ruler, Qin Shi Huang, and why the army of statue warriors came to be buried here. Complicating matters, Sima Qian, the historian who chronicled the emperor's life, offers little help. Sima Qian wrote nothing of the existence of the terracotta warriors. There's nothing in his account that suggests to us that he was aware of their production and interment in the pits that surrounded the first emperor of Qin's mausoleum. Answering questions about the terracotta warriors requires a journey back into China's early history. In 246 BC, a new king ascended the throne in the western state of Qin. Little was expected of him at the time. He was only 13 years old. His name was Ying Zhang, 
the ruler who would later become Qin Shi Huang, China's first emperor. Following royal tradition, upon taking the throne, the king ordered his prime minister, Lu Buwei, to fulfill a special command. By the second year of their reign, kings would begin building their own tombs. That's why, at 14, Ying Zong ordered the construction of his mausoleum. The capital of Qin State, Xi'anyang, is one of the oldest cities in China. It was the eastern gateway to the famed Silk Road trade route and served as a center of politics, economy, and culture. Around 246 BC, on the outskirts of Xi'anyang, work began on what would become the young ruler's final resting place. The burial mound is 345 meters wide, 350 meters long, and 55 meters high, a structure bigger than the Great Pyramid of Giza. The location of the Terracotta Army site is almost a mile away from the emperor's burial mound. Because of the distance from Qin Shi Huang's tomb, archaeologists suspected there was more to the site than the life-size clay soldiers they uncovered in one of several pits below ground. Their investigations led to the conclusion that the soldiers served as bodyguards for Qin Shi Huang in the afterlife. Some scholars think that they are defending it. Some think that they are a representation of the retinue that uh, Qin Shi Huang would have traveled around his empire with. Our investigation of the site revealed it to be extremely large. In the first pit, we found a large number of clay figures mostly infantrymen, some charioteers and horses, about 6,000 of them. The discovery of the Terracotta Army helped us understand a great deal about the time. All of the clay figures were very realistic. So by studying them, we learned much about the Qing military, the political situation, even the clothing they wore. During the 3rd century BC, the region we now call China was a bloody battleground. With the collapse of the centuries-old Zhou dynasty, seven states erupted in endless wars for supremacy. The battles went on for decades. Finally, by 221 BC, under ruler Ying Zhang, the Qin defeated all the other states. And the reasons for his success can be found in the innovations that produced his remarkable army of the dead. The world has never seen anything quite like the terracotta warriors. The figures are tall and wear expressions that reveal the imposing character and fierce resolve of the legendary Qin Dynasty soldiers. Looking at them individually and in their military formation, you get a real appreciation for the strength of the Qing army. They're extraordinary, and it's no wonder that with them, Qing Shi Huang conquered the other states. Pit one of the terracotta warriors displays the battle formation of the Qin military. The first three rows consist of archers facing forward. Behind them stand infantrymen in 38 rows, poised to strike upon the commander's order. The flanks are defended by troops on the periphery facing outward, watching for threats from any direction. Pit 1 contains a well-organized infantry corps of 6,000 men. The warriors once held weapons befitting their duties. 
and the shapes of their hands all differ accordingly. These are spears and dagger axes used by the infantrymen. Crossbows and bronze arrows allowed the warriors to attack enemies from a distance. During the excavation, one discovery took the archaeologists by surprise. Despite being buried for over 2,000 years, the swords of the infantrymen were still in pristine, rust-free condition. The Qin Dynasty's metalwork was highly advanced for its time. Researchers examined why the weapons maintained their keen cutting edge and didn't rust. We did tests to see why the swords were still sharp after being buried so long. We found evidence of chromium oxide on the sword blades, which prevents them from rusting. It's impressive that China had developed this technology over a thousand years before the Western world. After all, Germany didn't discover this method until the 1930s, and America not until the 1950s. Bonding a chromium oxide coating to a metal surface requires temperatures of 1400 degrees Fahrenheit to toughen it and make it durable. Because of this advanced technology, the Qin state's weaponry and its superior troop strength gave its fighters an advantage over their enemies on the battlefield. The initial excavation of Pit 1 took over two years. During that time, the archaeologists uncovered two more pits in the vicinity. Pit 2 is located about 60 feet from Pit 1 and is smaller in size. But measuring 136 yards wide and 107 yards long, it's still three times larger than a soccer field. The figures and weapons here differ from Pit 1. Pit 2 contains a variety of soldiers, including archers and charioteers, compared to Pit 1, which contains mainly infantrymen. After 20 months spent removing earth and timbers, archaeologists found Pit 2 to be full of chariots, archers, and cavalrymen. Soldiers with crossbows stood in formation at the front, while cavalrymen were positioned behind them. Flanked to the side was a mixed array of mid-sized chariots and infantrymen, with three armored men placed in each of the four horse chariots. Archaeologists estimate the number of horses in Pit 2 to be over 500. The horse figures revealed a feature previously unknown to experts. We found the horse saddles in this pit to be very well decorated. Putting a saddle on a horse makes for more comfortable riding, and it also gives you an advantage when you're fighting in battle. Before this discovery, scholars thought that saddles were first used in the Han Dynasty, the empire that followed the Qin. Saddles were known to greatly improve the speed, mobility, and tactical strategy of the cavalrymen. Another innovation found in Pit 2 involved the crossbowmen in the front ranks. Their powerful weapons had an automatic trigger, which may have been the reason for the Qin army's success in battle. Some experts think the crossbow had a range twice that of today's modern assault rifles. 
During battle, soldiers with crossbows must have shot bronze arrows continuously from the front lines, bombarding the enemy forces from as much as a mile away. Later research has found that the triggers of the crossbows had standardized parts. This would allow soldiers to quickly replace broken or defective triggers with a spare while on the battlefield. This was the earliest instance of China standardizing weapons. We think of standardization as a modern concept, but examining these weapons from the Qing dynasty, it's clear they were technologically advanced in terms of production. So scholars now say the Qing dynasty was the first to make weapons with replaceable parts. Systemization was not limited to the crossbow. Most other weapons, including bronze arrowheads, spears, swords, and dagger axes, were standardized as well. It meant that Qin soldiers would not be hampered by broken weapons during battle, a key factor to their success. While pits one and two contain thousands of infantrymen and cavalrymen, pit three is the smallest and houses the army's high-ranking officers. This separate command post was unusual. Today's modern warfare features superior officers issuing orders from a command post behind the lines. But this was rare in ancient battles where strategies were different. Back then, most military commanders let troops onto the battlefield. But instead, the Qing officers used their skills to issue orders from behind the front lines. The Qin dynasty had well-trained soldiers, state-of-the-art weapons, and employed bold military tactics. This is how experts believe they fought. When the commanding officers gave the orders, soldiers with crossbows at the front lines attacked first, raining arrows down on the enemy. This would plunge the adversaries into chaos, while Qin infantrymen, following behind, would begin their advance. Charioteers and cavalrymen would then rush to outflank the enemy. With infantrymen charging head-on, Cavalrymen and charioteers used a pincer action to surround the enemy and close off any escape route. The result, annihilation. With superior weapons and brilliant tactics, the Qin army defeated the neighboring states in less than a decade, setting the stage for a new era in the region's history. But even though he now had victory in his hands, Ying Zhang, would crave something more. In 221 BC, following the end of nearly two centuries of war, a grand ceremony took place in the Xianyang Palace. Here, Ying Zhang, the 38-year-old ruler of Qin State, declared himself sovereign over the lands of the former Zhou Dynasty. He assumed the new name Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of the new Qin dynasty. When the king of Qin, Ying Zheng, crowned himself the first emperor of the Qin, that was an unprecedented move, and it shows that he understood the magnitude of what he had accomplished. It suggests to us that he no longer saw himself merely as a terrestrial king, but rather he saw his role as being elevated to that of the ruler of an empire um, and a role that could be viewed perhaps on cosmic proportions. Qin Shi Huang would go on to unify his realm by imposing a series of reforms, abolishing the long-standing feudal system, centralizing the legal code, standardizing weights and measures, introducing a common currency and establishing a single writing system. But despite his triumphant achievement, there was one goal that eluded Qin Shi Huang. 
It was his desire to conquer death, to be immortal, and emperor in the afterlife. Qin Shi Huang's pursuit of immortality is known to us from the accounts of Sima Qian. This would not have been at all unusual at the time. What is unusual, however, is the great lengths to which he went in order to create his post-mortem environment. The idea is clearly that the deceased would continue to live in death as they did in life, and they would want the comforts that they had in life. Qin Shi Huang demanded that his mausoleum which had been under construction since he was 14 years old, reflect the scale of his power and grandeur. Ancient records say over 700,000 laborers worked on the site for over three decades. They created a prominent earthen mound that rises to 150 feet while digging the emperor's royal resting place deep underground. In the past, people have said that while they were building the tomb, workers dug down through three separate springs, which we think means three layers of underground water. That's about 85 to 90 feet below the surface. It was brutal, backbreaking work that came with a high price. Archaeologists later discovered mutilated skeletons that told a horrifying story. Countless workers died of exhaustion and were buried in mass graves. Others were apparently killed to keep them from revealing the secrets and location of the tomb. It took 38 years to complete the mausoleum of Qin Shi Huang. His royal chamber was placed in the center of the burial mound. Inner and outer walls were built complete with watchtowers. Many pits containing the warriors of the Terracotta Army were also located nearby. The Emperor's underground palace was constructed over 2,000 years ago, but it still awaits excavation. Qin Shi Huang's tomb is in the middle of the mausoleum grounds, which is just under a square mile in area. No one knows for certain, but it's thought that the underground palace lies under the earthen mound there. Compared to the other mausoleum sites, this is considered to be one of the world's largest, if not the largest. Nearly five million visitors come annually to see the excavation site. What draws in most visitors is the massive terracotta army. Out of 8,000 life-size terracotta warriors found by excavators, not one of them appears to be the same. Because of their highly realistic appearance, it is often said that the terracotta warriors were intended to be portraits. While we cannot answer this question definitively, what we do know is that their method of construction was highly modular and that this was work carried out by palace artisans. Experts marvel at the creation of the terracotta warriors, saying they could not easily be made, even with modern technology. So how did Qin state artisans create them? This demonstration shows contemporary artisans creating similar figures out of the local clay. If the clay is too wet or too dry, the sculpted figure would fall apart. So back then, Qin artisans used a special technique to create the warriors. In this case, they made clay ropes and formed the figure from bottom to top. As a result, the hollow statues would be less likely to collapse under their own weight. This method also lent itself to individualizing each figure. By adjusting the thickness of the clay ropes, the sculptors could make different shaped bodies. Once the bodies were complete, they would add the finishing touches, such as armor details. Complex parts, such as hands and feet, were made separately and dried before being fitted to the bodies. Experts think the heads were not based on the craftsman's imagination, but instead modeled on real soldiers. 
Studies of the figures show that no two are exactly alike. From their facial features and apparel, it's possible to discern differences in the warrior's age, function, and rank, as well as determining where in the country they came from. The facial features of the warriors reflect a range of people from the empire, including the Sanxi area, the eastern part of China, uh, Sichuan, even the western region of China. In 1999, excavators found different terracotta figures in a pit located not far from the others. They were in sharp contrast to the soldiers and officers of the terracotta army. To begin with, they're not dressed in military outfits or wearing any type of armor, nor are they aligned in a group formation. Decorative walls from the later Han Dynasty provide important clues. The bare-chested figures are in dynamic poses, very different from their military counterparts. The figures look like they're captured in mid-performance. They show us another side of the emperor's royal life back then. Royal life during Qin Shi Huang's reign had all the trappings of luxury and splendor. According to historian Sima Qian, 10,000 court ladies chosen from all over the country lived in the emperor's palace. They served at the pleasure of Qin Shi Huang, with the best dancers performing during banquets. These banquets, acrobatic troops also displayed their skills for the court. They were called baiji, a word referring to entertainments that gave a hundred different joys to the audience. Included in the performances were demonstrations of physical dexterity and strength. The Baiji were also known to travel to the battlefields to demonstrate their skills and boost morale among the troops in the field. Acrobatics is one of the oldest arts in China, a tradition famously carried on to this day. The continuing excavation unearthed other artifacts, elegant bronze cranes, swans, and geese, which symbolize longevity. In yet another pit, archaeologists found stone armor made for Qin Shi Huang's warriors, leading researchers to wonder what other treasures will be revealed next. As first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang wanted to enjoy the comforts and treasures of his empire, not only during his lifetime, but in the afterlife as well. That's why his nearly one square mile mausoleum complex contains many rare and priceless objects from throughout his realm. Qin Shi Huang's mausoleum is the largest of all the royal tombs in China. We found it to be relatively well preserved, containing a rich array of artifacts. So far, we found about 180 pits filled with fascinating objects. It's a real underground treasure trove that tells us a great deal about him and his realm. We know that he survived assassination plots, so he must have been uh, cognizant of that fact, that his life could end at any moment. And we know that he traveled with a large retinue of soldiers when he surveyed his new empire uh, so as to protect against assassination plots. So on the one hand, it seems like he was quite concerned, almost obsessed with dying. 
But on the other hand, he was laying some of the most intricate preparations to go on living after death. The emperor's mausoleum has yet to be excavated, but many features of the elaborate world Qin Shi Huang had built underground have been unearthed thanks to the work of archaeologists and artisans. The carefully organized effort to reconstruct the world of the emperor begins with labeling artifacts and fragments found at the site. The labels have two functions. First, they indicate where an artifact was found in the pit. Second, it makes it easier for us to find similar pieces while we're doing our restoration work. As part of the restoration process, pieces of the relics are carefully cleaned using special tools to avoid damaging them. Then, a special glue is delicately applied to broken portions of the object to assure proper bonding. These craftsmen know they're not only reassembling pieces of an historic artifact, but also restoring pieces of lost time, bringing the past to life. This is how many of the thousands of terracotta warriors have been reconstructed. During the immense excavation and restoration project, researchers encountered another surprise. Today, the warriors appear reddish-brown and gray, consistent with the color of the clay in the area. But in removing 2,000 years of dirt and debris from the surface of the figures, traces of vibrant paint were detected. Archaeologists have concluded that the terracotta warriors looked far different when they were originally created. The soldiers were painted very colorfully. You find traces of red, yellow, green, purple, and black. The colors on this figure faded when it was excavated, but we found most soldiers still have bits of paint on their uniform collars. This is how some of the warriors looked when they were found buried in the dirt. But once the figures were exposed to the air, the colors quickly disappeared like a mirage. So how did the terracotta army appear at the time of Qin Shi Huang's reign? Based on the research of archaeologists, who have studied these figures for over 40 years, the warriors would have looked very different. The finished warriors would have been a splendid, awe-inspiring sight 2,200 years ago. one nation out of a cauldron of warring states, Qin Shi Huang did not retreat inside his lavish palace. He made a number of inspection tours of his empire, traveling under the protection of his guards. On at least five occasions, the first emperor made a tour of his empire. It seems, in fact, that he really enjoyed doing this that he preferred getting out of the capital and surveying the lands that he had conquered. I think it's part of human nature to want to see, in effect, what you own. This bronze chariot found in Pit 2 shows the remarkable craft of the Qin Dynasty artisans. 
It's a half-sized replica of the one Qin Shi Huang rode during his journeys. The bronze chariot really is the best relic, the crown jewel of them all, especially when you consider its size and the technology involved in its construction. It consists of about 3,000 pieces. Even using modern processes like welding, you can see it would take a great deal of effort to build it. Originally, two bronze chariots were found completely smashed in a pit, just 20 yards from Qin Shi Huang's burial chamber. This smaller vehicle with a high canopy is a half-size model of the escort chariot, which rode ahead of the emperor in a procession. Together, the presence of these two chariots may represent Qin Shi Huang's expectation that he would be able to continue touring his underground empire in the afterlife. The fascination generated by Qin Shi Huang's terracotta warriors continues decades after they were first discovered in 1974. But at the site of the first emperor's mausoleum, one great mystery lingers. Though hundreds of relics have been discovered and excavated, Qin Shi Huang's burial chamber has remained unexplored. We don't know what's actually inside the burial site. In his writings, Sima Qian describes it in great detail, mentioning that there are depictions of the constellations in the ceiling overhead and on the floor, recreations of rivers and oceans filled with mercury. Since Sima Qian wrote his account a century after the emperor's death, scholars have doubted his descriptions of the burial chamber. But recent studies have found high concentrations of mercury at the site. Scientists use modern remote sensors and spectral analysis machines to investigate the burial site. And what they found was surprising. The level of mercury in the soil at the site measured 20 times higher than in the area surrounding the site. One ancient method of preserving bodies after death involves deep burials in airtight conditions. This keeps oxygen from reaching the corpse and slows down decomposition. When this tomb in Hunan province was opened, archaeologists made a remarkable find. Inside was a Han Dynasty noblewoman known as the Lady of Dai. Her body had been buried nearly 40 feet underground. No one anticipated a discovery like this. Though her death occurred 21 centuries ago, the Lady of Dai's body is well preserved. Most of her internal organs are intact, and blood still remains in her veins. Her skin is moist and elastic, like that of the living. Her discovery led researchers to consider a new theory. We think it's possible that Qin Shi Huang's body might have been preserved in the same way as the Lady of Dai's body especially if his tomb was sealed in the same way and he was buried deep in the earth. More clues representing how the emperor's body may have been preserved appeared in other parts of China. This is a shroud made of jade for a king of the Han dynasty who died 2,000 years ago. If the emperor was in fact buried in a suit of jade armor, it's possible the decomposition process has slowed down. This method of burial was common among the Qing dynasty royalty, so we can infer that perhaps Qin Shi Huang could have been buried this way. 210 BC, Qin Shi Huang, on another inspection tour of his empire, was struggling with illness. Despite his search for the elixir of life that he believed would grant him immortality, 
He died at 50 years old. Now began his last earthly journey, back to Xi'an and his final resting place. He had created a small-scale version of his empire and his palace underground, where he could oversee the world he unified for eternity. It had taken some 700,000 workers 38 years to build Qin Shi Huang's royal tomb. Then in 210 BC, the emperor, together with his many priceless treasures, his childless wives, and his dreams of immortality, was sealed in his burial chamber. Historian Sima Qian, writing in his records of the Grand Historian, described in detail what the emperor's tomb was to have contained. The sun, moon, and stars were drawn in the sky to bless and protect the afterlife. Underneath the stars was a miniature version of geographical features. Mercury filled the river so as never to dry up, and torches burning mermaid oil will never be blown out. Qin Shi Huang had unified China for the first time, establishing a new form of government, uniform laws, weights and measures, and a single writing system. Ancient historians say the underground world he created reflected the grandeur of his many achievements. But for now, there's no way to know for certain whether the accounts describing Qin Shi Huang's tomb are true. The Chinese government has steadfastly refused to excavate the first emperor's burial chamber, a position at odds with what many in the general public would prefer. There are no plans to excavate the underground palace in the future, because the excavation itself could destroy what we're trying to preserve. Though we're not excavating the tomb at present, we might consider whether, in the future, we could use new forms of technology to investigate the underground palace. In my view, I'd say it's possible. For now, we can only peer into the emperor's tomb through ancient writings and our imagination. During his life, Qin Shi Huang hungered for immortality. And now, over 2,000 years after his death, thanks to the work of archeologists and artisans and the unforgettable terracotta army that still guards his memory, he's achieved it.